Hi everyone, this is Garrett Heater, producing artistic director of Chelsea Opera, and this is another episode of Hot Tea and High Seas with Chelsea Opera. Today we are joined by Jessica Sandage, and she is a former Chelsea Opera performer. And I'm so excited to have you with us today, Jessica. First things first, let's get the important question out of the way. <laughs> what tea are you drinking today? I am drinking peppermint tea, which is my favorite. Yeah, peppermint tea. I've definitely uh, hit the peppermint tea uh, category already during these interviews. So this <laughs> is, I've moved on to fruits. So this is oh, nice. black cherry berry. So I just, I just bought this today. It's, it's pretty good. Good mug. Oh, celestial too. seasonings. Yeah, this is, I, I, I don't know. It was like $5. I got it at an antique store and, you know, I cleaned That's it first. Fast. So, <laughs> so. all hard. right. So, <laughs> Jessica, where are you and why are you there? I am in Los Angeles, California, where it is a brisk 63 degrees. Uh, oh, I think it's like 35 <laughs> here today. <laughs> right. right. So um, I moved here. I'm originally from here. And I, I lived in New York for about 15 years, but I moved back to be closer to family and, and start over and, and bring some opera out to this coast. Bring some opera out to the West Coast. Very yeah. good. <laughs> how, is that, how is that going so far, bringing opera out to the West Coast? It's going pretty well. I yeah. just, yeah. I mean, I, I just sang a show this past weekend. I did a, a two one acts with Pacific Opera Project and we did a drive-in opera. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, so yeah I heard about, I think it was um, Tulsa Opera did Rigoletto in a ball field. Oh, wow. And they opened the stadium up and they had like 2,000 people go. Crazy. Wow. People are being very good. creative at this time. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, so did you like the, that experience? That sort of, you know, out, outside the box experience? Was yeah, I, I mean, I, I appreciated it. I think it's really important right now that to try and keep it going. And I think people need an activity to get out, um, sure. get out of their, their bubbles and do something safe and especially support the arts. And it really just felt like another show. It didn't feel, you know, like, oh, this is weird. I don't know how this works. It felt very natural. We all played our parts. We all knew where to go and, and everyone worked really hard to make it happen. And it, it felt very natural. And you, and, and correct me for uh, speaking out of my ignorance here, but um, did you guys have to wear masks when you performed? So the singers, there were four women in the cast and we basically agreed to self-quarantine outside, yeah, sure. outside of rehearsals. And we were in each other's faces, you know, and uh, we each got tested before we started and Great. getting tested afterwards before we see our families. Awesome. Or, yeah, yeah. And it and, worked. And speaking of opera, which is why we're together today, um, you have participated in productions with Chelsea Opera. And yes. I was kind of hoping you might uh, let our audiences know what productions you were in, the roles that you played, and when that occurred. Absolutely. Um, I, Chelsea Opera was in a very important company to me because they gave me my first real role with a professional company. Yeah, we hear that a lot. <laughs> yeah, right. I just moved to New York. It was 2007, and I got the role of Nella in Gianni Skiki, and it was a blast. It was so much fun. I, I'm still friends with some of the cast members, um, including Peter Kendall Clark, who is amazing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We became friends in that production, and we've been friends ever since. Um, and it was so much fun. I learned so much from Lynn and Lee and, and just had a blast. And then I did The Countess in their Noce di Figaro, mm -hmm. which was in 2010. And that was also a great experience with Peter. Again, he was the Count um, and, and other amazing cast members. And I, I remember I learned a lot from Lynn. Um, it was really the beginning of my career. And I, I remember I was so concerned about the voice, the voice. And she really got me to think about the acting and my face, facial expressions and how to really give more than I thought I was, you know, more than I thought I could. 
um, and it was really helpful and was a good good experience. Yeah, and uh, with uh, a comic opera like The Marriage of Figaro, and you were sharing the stage with Peter Kendall Clark in yeah. that one. Are there yeah. any are there any like funny anecdotes specifically from that opera? Well, we took some selfies together, and it was in the era of the twenties, mm -hmm. and um, he had a very thin mustache. Oh, great! <laughs> <laughs> I still have some selfies of that very thin mustache and my very thin eyebrows and um, just some fond memories. We just really love to ham it up together. Yeah, uh, Peter's a great guy and he has really made an impact online because he's been doing a nightly concert, I believe it's in Brooklyn, that yes. he's been videoing and sharing and he, Songs from the Stoop, I think it's called. That's or right. Songs from the Ledge or something along those lines. Right. And it's just very clever and, and, and very much, um, a brilliant Peter thing to do. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, so. Absolutely. He I don't know if he's, that. I don't know if he's gone for the pencil thin mustache <laughs> while he's been doing that, but right. it might be a game changer. You should write to him and, and make a definitely. suggestion. Yes, definitely. So, so Chelsea Opera was a very, uh, a, a transformative company for you to be associated with very early on in your career. And what, what did that lead to as far as performing opportunities after your time with Chelsea Opera? I, well, I got exposure in New York City, which was wonderful. Um, and it led to a couple of young artist programs um, where I sang for some agents. I got my first agent in 2012. Mm -hmm. And that led to, um, well, I, I guess most notably, I, I understudied at the Met for three seasons. Fantastic. Um, the last time I covered there was in Marnie um then you oh go wow over. yeah mm -hmm. yeah that was so much fun <laughs> I bet it was. Yeah. It was amazing it was amazing um and it yeah i mean it, and i also went back to chelsea opera for a couple of concerts i sang a beautiful song by stephen paulus they did a tribute concert to him and terry quinn the librettist mm -hmm. terry quinn um it was a beautiful song um for about Hester Prynne and, and her baby. And, and oh, wow. Yeah, it was beautiful. And I, I met some colleagues there, which led to an amazing church job. <laughs> yeah. um, and just, you know, other things I've done since then, I, I sang in Hong Kong uh, for the first time. I sang The Merry Widow in Hong Kong. I, um, I recently, this past year, sang with Sarasota Opera. I did two shows there. And, you know, I, I've, I've always kept in touch with Lynn and Lee and, and they've always been really supportive. And I even did um, a cruise. I did a Carol's and Coco cruise with Lynn, where we went on one of those little boats around oh. the pier. <laughs> yeah. And we sang carols with some of the Chelsea Opera people. And um, gotcha. yeah. yeah, that was fun. I remember that. Wow, uh, that, what a nice memory to have. Yeah. You're on the yeah. holidays, that's very sweet. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but yes, I, I always think of them fondly and I, I think it was a great feeling to, you know, to get that, that boost from them, to get some experience and get some exposure in New York. And um, I should say that Chelsea Opera has made quite a little uh, name for itself working with contemporary composers on new right. works. And mm -hmm. um, sometimes with a production like Glory Denied, it's one of the first productions that um, uh, was done, that was done. And now you know, a production like, uh, or an opera like Glory Denied has gone on to uh, wonderful heights, you know, as far as popularity um, uh, or internationally. And you mentioned that you were covering uh, for, uh, in Marnie at the Met, and were, were you around the composer of that piece? And would you wanna speak on that a little bit about that type of experience? Oh, absolutely. Um, he, you know, working with a living composer, first of all, is always a thrill because it's, it's a living, breathing thing. And he's listening for things and he's always, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like an organic experience. It's happening in front of you. 
Um, and he came into some of the, the cover rehearsals even and listened to us, which I thought was really interesting because you know, normally we're just kind of in a little bubble and we do our cover rehearsals and we do a room run and maybe some people watch it, but, but he came in to watch it. And I thought that that was really great that he did that. Um, and that he was open to hearing different voices and, and hearing different interpretations. Yeah. Um, right before, and we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the pandemic, but um, in the month of March of, of this year, uh, Chelsea Upper was supposed to produce a double bill of um, a piece by Tom Chipulo and a piece by Ben Moore. And um, they weren't able to happen because uh, it was, it was uh, the shows were going to be produced at the end of March. And uh, by the middle of March, as you well remember, everything started to fall apart. The dominoes moved very quickly. So we had to cancel. We were almost sold out with those two those two productions. And um, what was nice for me as an assistant director on that piece, like you were saying, was being able to, to work with living composers and just to hear them talk about uh, why they made the decisions that they did with their compositions. It's really amazing because you don't get to do that with Mozart. You don't get to do that with Puccini. So right. it's just so important, I think, having those, those conversations and how exciting for someone like you to do that in such a high profile way with a production like Marnie. That's fantastic. So yeah. now that we're on the topic of the pandemic, um, you know, it's been a really difficult time for artists because opportunities to further their career have dried up and opportunities like you, but you, like um, you discussed with the drive-in um, opera, those are pretty few and far between. When they're happening, it's 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 a big deal, you know, that the companies were able to to get something like that together in such a short amount of time. Do you have any advice for artists um, on how to spend their time right now, where maybe there are there are no opportunities for them? Absolutely. I, I started this pandemic like we all did. I was furloughed, uh, or maybe you, many people weren't even working at the time, but I was furloughed from my singing job and displaced and just in shock. Um, and I just started to think about things I wanted to sing that I hadn't had the opportunity to sing yet. Um, art songs. Um, I did a a live stream of the Hermit Songs by Samuel Barber with a pianist friend of mine, Douglas Martin. And we just collaborated via Zoom and emails and <laughs> we made it happen and we did a live stream of this song cycle. And then a couple of days later, I, I had an offer, I had two offers for to do this drive-in opera and then to also do a, um, a green screen opera. So I'm going to do... Oh, nice. Yes. And I'll, I'll, that's going to be a, a green screen opera to make it look like it's in on a set. Yeah, you're going to be like a Marvel superhero. Right. On a set in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I just started all the training. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but no, I... And I, I can tell you more about that too in a minute. But I guess... Absolutely. My, my advice or my encouragement would be because it's, it's hard to give advice and it's hard to hear advice right now because it's been, you know, almost nine months and it can, this career is discouraging enough on its own to now be so isolated. Um, I think find things that you love and find people that you love working with and reach out to them because we can't do it alone, but there are ways to work together and there are ways to fulfill that, you know, that void that we all have. And I want to see more people live streaming. I mean, let's do it. There's no, there's no shame in it and no. And you mentioned, you mentioned the live streaming. I do want to talk more about the green screen because that's really intriguing. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. we're definitely going to get to that. But okay. my, my question right now is I feel like with um, musicians that the technology seems like an insurmountable hurdle 
So if I can pick your brain and maybe this will inspire other people to just get over it or, or learn about it and, and, and break through that technological barrier, what was the learning curve for you for something oh, like that? This is huge. I basically, I had moved into this apartment and I created this little studio and I started with my laptop and then I started with uh, a mic Mm -hmm. And I plugged it, I plugged it into the laptop, a USB mic, and I learned GarageBand and how to record myself on GarageBand with a MIDI track. Gotcha. And it was like, it was really hard. It was like <laughs> sure. taking the AP exam for US history all over again. It was just like so hard and I wanted to cry and I wanted to give up because as opera singers, this isn't something we've really been taught how to do. Sure. And recording our voices is really tricky. Yeah. So I did some research because I was asked to do a recording project. I had to record 11 tracks for a wonderful piece um, with American Opera Project, and which, is, which was fantastic. And I wanted it to be, you know, really well done. So it was really hard work. So what I discovered was... I could upgrade without spending too much money by getting uh, an audio interface, which is this little thing um, where you plug in the mic and you plug in the headphones and you can change the volume and the, and the voice level, which is the gain. You know, you can turn that way down as an opera singer. You don't want that too high. Um, and I upgraded the microphone to something that is more forgiving to the operatic voice. Gotcha. It's not, it's not gonna compress the voice too much. It's gonna allow it to have its bloom and overtones and, and all of that. So I did some research and I asked friends, you know, techie friends um, and Google, all the Google, all the time, you know, how to do this, how to do that and just trial and error. Um, yeah, so that's how I learned how to do the audio recording. And then to make the video, I just use my phone. Okay. Um, I use my Seems iPhone. Seems easy enough. <laughs> great. You know, the, I, the iPhone 11 is, is what people are using now. Um, I think the 11 Pro is even, is even better, but I have the 11. Right. I've done videos where I'm lip singing yeah. to the audio track. Um, so then you have good quality audio, but you also have the video. So. Yes, I have had a huge learning curve from June to now. It was a big learning experience. Yeah, you picked up that, just to call it an interface? Yes. With all those cords, and I, I could feel like my face go numb because it just makes, it gives me such agita to have to worry about technology. And I, I can't even imagine, you know, a, a singer whose livelihood is dependent on still remaining, um, as high profile as they can make themselves, you know, during this time. So they're not like feeling the living under a rock and having to inspire yourself to get the knowledge to go there, to do that. So um, I give you a lot of credit for, oh. <laughs> for educating yourself because it, it seems like, I think, you know, at least for me navigating things like that, it just feels completely impossible. So, you know what? People have more time now and they can spend it on self-education in yes. a way, even if it has to do with deal with technology. Yes, it is, <laughs> it is daunting. It really is. Absolutely. But like I said, like even with, with music collaborating, we can't do it alone. Sometimes the tech stuff, you can't do it alone either. And people are home a little bit more. Some people aren't, but, um, I think there's definitely a feeling of we're in this together. So yeah, what do you need? What's your question? Maybe I can help. I think, and I, I found even if the person didn't have the answer, just asking was huge. It was like, how, okay, I plugged this in here, but I don't know, it, and what is this switch? And even just asking the person, it was like, oh, hey, wait, no, I figured it out. And <laughs> that, you know, yeah, we do have more time on our hands in general which is, a, you know, a gift 
um, and a curse. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people are learning that, that they can they can deal with it both ways, right? You can either see it one way or the other. Now, let's get back to that green screen. Yes. Tell us some more about the green screen. So there's a conductor here who I worked with last summer. Um, his name is Christophe Van Grisper, and he works with Long Beach Opera and Angel's Vocal Art. And he's a conductor, pianist, coach. And he approached me after he saw the Hermit songs that I put on Facebook and said, I've been thinking of doing a piece that, that sort of mirrors what we're going through, but also gives opera to the people in a medium that is new and maybe we can use more of during this pandemic. So he has a green screen literally in his house and he set up a screen around his piano, his grand piano, and he set up lights and um, a camera. So we're going to do uh, La Voix Humaine by Poulain. Great, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we're going to do it as if it's really happening. Um, right. So the green screen is idea is basically something that singers, you know, I, I think there are some small companies that are that are trying it as well, where you can either dress in costume and be, you know, on the stage. But we were kind of thinking more along the lines of, you know, what if it's like I'm in the house or I'm in the room, you know, I have the, the actual telephone um, and sort of capturing that feeling of isolation that we're all kind of feeling and, yeah. and using and using this piece um and using opera to you know express that so that's that's the goal with that project and do you have a release date that we can all look forward to with that yeah it's going to be uh mid-december it's coming up great yeah amazing yeah. cool yeah all right jessica our time together has come to an end so with the holidays coming up, I'm wondering if you have a wish for the new year that we can end on today. Yes, it's hard to believe that we're almost to December, um, but I'm hoping that with the new year and the new, uh, lots of new things coming up and hopefully with this, what we've learned from social distancing and wearing masks and, and safety protocol, hopefully we can kick this virus away and be safe, but also find ways to be together and make music together and find a way to uh, find something in yourself that motivates you, find something that inspires you, um, that gets that, that fire going again, you know, whether it's picking up a guitar and singing opera with your guitar or you know, singing a piece you've always wanted to do that you've never done. Um, just to kind of get that, that inspiration going. I think we all need it. And I think even when one person starts it, it inspires other people to do it as well. So. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Nicely said. All right, everybody. This was another episode of Hot Tea and High Seas with Chelsea Opera. Jessica Sandage, it was wonderful to have you with us today. I hope you Thank have you so a much. happy and healthy holiday season. Yes, and, you too. Uh, Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Bye, everybody. <laughs>